Year after year, generation after generation, Genesis keeps improving. In no time, they'll be a real threat to the established luxury brands from Germany. Is this the year that it happens? Is this the car that can pull them over the top? This is the all new 2022 Genesis GV70, a compact luxury SUV that competes with the likes of the Mercedes-Benz GLC, BMW X3, and Audi Q5. Over the course of this video, I'll try to answer those questions, but before we get to that, do us a favor and hit those like and subscribe buttons below and head over to edmunds.com slash sellmycar to get a cash offer on your vehicle. The GV70 starts right around $42,000 for the 2.5T standard model, and it tops out at over $63,000 for the 3.5T Sport Prestige. You can probably tell from those model names that there are two engine choices. The base is a turbocharged 2.5 liter four cylinder that's good for 300 horsepower and 311 pound feet of torque. That's already more powerful than other base engines in the class. It's paired with an eight speed automatic transmission and all wheel drive is standard. The upgraded engine is a 3.5 liter twin turbo V6 that cranks out 375 horsepower and 391 pound feet. That's up there with other engine upgrades from rivals, including the Porsche Macan GTS. At least for now, Genesis's main advantage is pricing. Versus the base GV70, a similarly equipped Mercedes GLC class, our top rated SUV in this class, sets you back 51 grand. That's nine grand more than the base GV70. Nine grand. At the top of the range, the GV70 3.5T Sport Prestige costs about $10,000 less than a similarly equipped AMG GLC 43. Of course, there's more to luxury cars than price, but that's a rather sizable price barrier and begs another question. Is the GLC $9,000 better? In a previous video, I made it pretty clear that I wasn't a fan of the GV80's styling. Can this smaller GV70 win me over? In design school, we had to say something positive in a critique first, so let's start there. I like the overall silhouette. It has a strong upright frontal area, and I like how the roof has a spoiler back there that defines a transition between the hatch. Otherwise, it'd look a little turtly like a lot of the other sport coupe SUVs. The GV80's grille was larger and had a more angular shape compared to this one, which is a little more rounded in the corners. Overall, I think it's better, but maybe still a little too big. The split headlights and taillights haven't won me over either. I feel like it's trying to draw just a little bit too much attention, almost like someone who's wearing a little bit too much eye makeup. At least the hash marks on the side under the mirrors are gone. But hey, style is subjective, and I know there are plenty of shoppers out there that like the visual impact Genesis has developed. And some may think the rest of the class looks boring. So let's hit the road and get some objective impressions. In general, my initial impressions from behind the wheel are positive. One thing I noticed right off the bat was I feel like I'm sitting just a little bit too high. I prefer to sit maybe an inch or two lower closer to the deck, but still not so bad. Another thing I noticed almost immediately was how firm the cushioning was. It's really firm. I can't imagine another car that's actually firmer except for maybe, I don't know, like a Lotus Elise. Um, but at the same time, after two hours or so of driving, my butt isn't sore, so it means it's pretty well shaped. You also have some built-in massage functions that are really subtle. They just gently kind of move the pressure points over time. We also have heated and cooled seats, which operate really well, although even at its most intense cooling setting, it's not as cold as some others might get. Power is more than adequate, especially with this 3.5 turbo engine. I mean, you really get up to speed fast and it sounds pretty decent too. It's got a nice raspy growl if you really put your foot into it. And with that in mind, I think even the 2.5 turbo will suffice for most drivers. The ride quality, it is quite a bit stiffer than what I'm used to from luxury SUVs. It's more comparable to something like the entry-level GLC AMG versions, or maybe the X3 if you have a sport suspension on it. Yeah, here's some really big bumps here. and Yeah, there's some noticeable impact harshness, at least on initial contact, but 
it's not so bad that I'm willing to write off the car for it. But that is one of those instances where Mercedes does do it better. Handling is pretty good and you can charge through some turns a bit quicker than you might think. So at least that different ride quality has a bit of a payoff with better handling. I do notice quite a bit more road and wind noise than I would in some of the German competitors, but you can easily drown that out just by turning up the volume a little bit. Visibility is decent. This roof pillar here isn't so thick that I have to bob my head back and forth to look through sharp left turns. And the view at the back is about what you'd expect from any SUV. Those roof pillars are thick and kind of take away some of your situational awareness back there, but if you're back into a spot, the surround view and rear view cameras take out any guesswork. Here on the highway, the advanced safety features and driver assistance perform pretty well. I'm using the Highway Driving Assist system right now, which combines the adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist to maintain a gap between you and the car ahead and also keep you centered in the lane. What I like about it is it's really smooth with its inputs. It's not hard on the pedals when things come to a stop. You know, it's not grabbing on the brakes really hard and really late. On top of that, it actually uses machine learning even when you're not using the adaptive cruise control. And what that does is it kind of senses how you drive and tries to mimic that when you activate the adaptive cruise control. A lane keep assist, I don't feel like I have to fight the wheel. Um, more than anything, it feels like the road is kind of reverse crowned in a U shape and kind of just keeps the car centered in there. Um, when the lane markers get faded and it gets confused, I don't have to fight the wheel for control. It just kind of, you just gently nurse it back into, into line. I also don't get a lot of false alarms with frontal collision warning or uh, blind spots. One thing I'm not a fan of is the blind spot camera system. When you signal for a lane change or for a right turn, a little image will be projected in the instrument panel showing what's behind you on the right side. For me, it's more of a distraction. I prefer just the typical amber lights on the outside or beeps. Uh, with this, especially at night, it can be a real distraction because you're driving along, you signal, and then something pops up in your ins instrument panel and you have to look down to see it. Um, Honda did it for a while. It didn't really work for them either. Of course, as a luxury SUV, the interior is vitally important and the Genesis does pretty well. Materials quality is good, maybe not quite as good as Mercedes, maybe not quite as good as BMW, but definitely better than let's say Lexus, Infiniti, and Acura. One thing that I do like better than the GV80 is the infotainment controller right here. Unlike the GV80s, which kind of had a flat dial that you had to spin around, this is a more traditional dial controller that pops up above the center console. And on top of that, there's a little trace pad here that also accepts handwriting recognition. The good thing is you don't accidentally have these inputs if you strike your hand across that touchpad. It ha you have to be pretty deliberate about it, and I like that. Also, this touch screen on the dash is right in my driver's sight line, so no problem there. And there's also an, a head-up display right in front of me with turn-by-turn -turn directions. One thing I'm not a fan of with the touch screen though is it's a bit of a reach. So you really have to lean forward and kind of take your eye off the road in order to operate it. It's not ideal, but this dial controller more than makes up for it. As far as storage goes, we have two medium sized cup holders here, a small bin here with a wireless phone charging pad and two USB ports. And here we have a moderately sized armrest bin and a little sliding tray as well. The door pockets are pretty well sized and you can fit some larger water bottles in there as well. A lot of the controls are run through the infotainment as well as this touch screen here for climate control. The good thing is they still add these physical dials for temperature adjustment. That's something I really like. You have just enough physical buttons and controls so that you don't have to dig through menus just to do simple operations. I also like this virtual instrument panel here. Now it uses eye tracking to give it a 3D look. So if you shift your gaze left, right, up, or down, you can kind of see the gauges move with you as if they are three-dimensional. It's a nice nod to traditional analog gauges, 
but it's nice to have all the flexibility of a virtual gauge too. Well, that's it for the front. Let's check out the back seats. Here in the back seat, I have an adequate amount of room. I'm five foot 10 and I'm sitting behind this driver's seat, which is set for me. Now I don't have a ton of foot space underneath and I'm getting a little close to the seat back, but as it is, I think it's fine. But I feel like other SUVs in the class might give me just a little bit more room or at least perceived room. There is a sense of airiness at least, and thanks to this very large panoramic sunroof, it really opens it up. This roof pillar here kind of cuts in a little bit in your periphery, but it's pretty forgivable. The seat comfort is pretty good. Um, we have some side bolsters here that kind of cradle you in versus just having a flat bench like a lot of other SUVs have. The seat cushion is just a little bit low for me. I'd like a little more thigh support, especially if I was on a long road trip. Another nice touch is the separate climate controls just for the rear seats. It's automatic climate control, so really you just have to set it once. Plus there's also heated seats for the outboard rear seats. Underneath is another two USB charge ports and a household power outlet. The big kicker, however, is behind me in the cargo area. The GV70 has 28.9 cubic feet of cargo space back there. That's almost 50% more than the GLC offers. That is impressive. And that really gives you the flexibility that a lot of SUV owners are looking for. So where do we stand with the all new 2022 Genesis GV70? Well, I think it's tantalizingly close to challenging the German brands like Mercedes, Audi, and BMW. There are some spots here and there where you can tell that it's not quite up to snuff, but in terms of performance, convenience, and technology, it's right up there. We can't wait to get it back to Edmunds headquarters to give it a full evaluation and test. But in the meantime, head on over to Edmunds.com for all the latest news, specs, and information on the GV70 and all of its competition. Thanks for watching and don't forget to hit like and subscribe below.